The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait a few more minutes for more people to be able to join us, so please bear with us. Thank you. Okay, so I think the majority of people have joined us now. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone again. Um, my name is Stacey Roberts, and I am the PD manager for IPLS. And this morning, we're going to um, be taken through the iPrimary Early Years curriculum by Kevin Hyatt, um, who is our first presenter. And then our second presenter is Crispin Evans, who um, has written the, the uh, professional development for Early Years for us. Um, and he will take us through what you can expect from the professional development. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do pop them in the questions box um, and we will get to them at the very end of the webinar. Um, we also have Christian on hand who, if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, uh, you, you can't hear, um, he will be able to help you. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. Cool, over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Stacey, and thanks everyone for signing in today. Um, we're going to talk about the new iPrimary Early Years curriculum um, with a particular focus on the professional development, and we're lucky to have uh, Crispin with us today, who's one of our professional development experts as well. So to start off with, it would help if I could actually work slides. There we go. Okay, so uh, we'll be having a look at the iProgress proposition, of which our reception content is a key part. Um, sadly, a very brief slide on me. Um, we'll also be talking about the curriculum, the teaching and learning support, and as I mentioned, the professional development. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Okay, so uh, first up, the least interesting slide. Um, I'm always told I have to include one of these. Uh, so that's me on the right. Um, my name's Kevin Hyatt. I'm currently uh, a senior publisher for Pearson Ed Excel. Um, my previous experience has been teaching English abroad, uh, as a primary school teacher and deputy head, um, and I've worked at educational charities and in educational consultancy and publishing for a few years now. Okay, on to the more interesting stuff. So, um, first up, just a very quick word about iProgress. So, iProgress with Pearson Ed Excel is uh, attempt, I think we've succeeded, to deliver a consistent learning journey for students, for teachers, for schools from ages three all the way up to ages 19. Previously we published for international GCSE and A level but uh, two years ago we introduced primary and lower secondary and now we're also adding on early years which is two additional years of content at the bottom. And the whole iProgress journey provides more than just curricula, it also provides support resources, tools and services, professional development and print and online teaching materials as well. And a particular focus on the early years. Okay, so at the moment we have iProimary, and that's support for six years of teaching in English, math, science, and computing. We're adding in uh, two years of pre-primary con content, that's uh, reception or kindergarten, whatever you call it, uh, or nursery, and pre-K. So there'll be eight years of content for our primary journey there. And the new curricula cover maths, designed to inspire mathematical curiosity and resilience, introducing key mathematical concepts, um, and trying to embed growth mindset in learners and teachers. 
Our English curriculum encourages early language development and exploration. And the third strand is the world around us. Uh, this combines some early science, so developing early research and questioning skills, and encourages social and creative development in students as well. All of the phases encourage the development of transferable skills through the use of active learning techniques. A close look at what the curricula look like. So this is an example from one year and one section of the maths curriculum. The uh, curricula themselves cover all of the prerequisites for students moving into full-time academic education and beginning our I primary program. So the idea is that after two years of learning, they're at the correct point to start year one. All of the curricula contain clear, exemplified learning objectives, which help support you in understanding the level children should be working at by the end of that year, and how the learning progresses over time. Over the two years, each of the curricula forms a clear learning ladder. And then as well as the curricula I mentioned, we provide lots of teaching and learning support as well. So as part of the program, all of this is provided for free. Uh, well, as part of it, um, not free. Um, we provide schemes of work. So this is topic-based planning. You might call it medium-term planning, called uh, covering the two years, grouping together complementary objectives within a curricula into themed topics and suggesting activities and resources. You might wish to create your own planning from this or use it as a loose framework for existing courses as well. It's entirely up to you. We give you the flexibility to do that, but it's fair to provide the support if you want it. The next level of support we provide is the lesson planning. So we provide detailed lesson by lesson planning for each curriculum for each year, including suggestions of activities suitable for a range of school settings and levels of support. Um, there's more activities and more ideas and more suggestions in there than you could need and there's clear guidance about which ones are and aren't appropriate for each activity. Uh, the lesson planning is such that it's there for every single day of every single curricula and again you can adapt it, you can change it to work more closely with your setting or you can ignore it completely if there's a particular topic you don't like. You've got the complete flexibility to use it however you want. The third um, piece of support I want to briefly talk about are the progress tests. These are end of topic tests for each curriculum. So they come about every half term, every five weeks in each curriculum. They're designed to check understanding and progress for a supportive discussion-based approach to assessment based around information-rich illustrations. There's detailed guidance and detailed mark schemes for the teacher, helping you to interpret children's answers and helping you to deliver these tests as well. Um, I, wouldn't want uh, a formal, lengthy, uh, written-based test for children of this age, and I think most practitioners used to early years wouldn't either. Um, the idea behind these assessments is the child won't actually know they're sitting in assessment. As far as they're concerned, it's a discussion with the teacher about a lovely picture, and it's the guidance for the teacher that helps the interpretation there. And then the final strand is professional development. So uh, we provide face-to-face, -face, although in the current climate, we're looking at other solutions, uh, and online support to help upskill teachers and give them the confidence to fully engage with the new curricula and what for some might be a new way of teaching and learning as well. As a quick snapshot or summary here, um, these are all of the things that the iPrimary reception course includes. So we've got those complete year-by-year -year curricula and the learning objectives we spoke about, the complete schemes of work, the lesson planning, the progress tests, which we update and add to every year, the professional development, uh, ongoing support via webinar, which tends to be uh, very responsive. So schools will contact us, uh, local Pearson teams will contact us and say there's a particular need uh, for a webinar on a particular theme or in a particular area and we'll try and find the right people to deliver that and organise it uh, at a time that's convenient to you. And then we also map to award-winning Pearson courseware. So the mapping that's included enables you to use uh, for, uh, the uh, additional textbooks or workbooks if you want to, but there's no requirement to do so. With that, a uh, very quick whistle stop tour of I Primary Reception. I'm going to pass over to Crispin now, who's going to talk in more depth about professional development.
Right, so I'll just unmute myself and make sure that uh, you can see the screens that you uh, you need to. So I'm just going to make sure I've got my slideshow showing. And uh, right, here we go. Now it's the first time I've I've used this uh, particular piece of software so do forgive me if there's a, a few stumbles, stumbles to start with but let's start in the same way as Kevin did by introducing myself. I'm uh, Crispin Evans, I am a former primary school teacher, education advisor and senior lecturer in education and I've worked as a consultant writing professional development for the last uh, about five or six years. Um, I pulled out this uh, picture of myself because I currently have what we are calling a lockdown haircut, which means I've got hair everywhere. So I found one where I'm looking a little smarter and I'm lucky enough to be based in the very uh, bottom corner, southwest corner of, of the UK, as you can see on that little map there, and even luckier to have that view from my office window. So that's the view I'm looking out on at, at the moment, although it is a bit grey and cloudy here. So let's crack on to look at the um, early years professional development that uh, that Kevin highlighted for us as part of the the package <clears throat> to ensure that you get the most out of your um, early years resources there's a professional development module that helps you introduce it really smoothly and I think that's essential when you um, bring any new resource into a school um, and the the professional development session as we as we see it will help staff understand those key pedagogies and the ethos which support the I primary early years resources but it will also help them investigate the the structure and progression within those resources and work with some of the sample lesson plans that, that Kevin spoke about um, in all of those curriculum areas the English maths and the world around us and also to um, discuss how best to um, organize in terms of classroom organization and best practice in the early years. I've tried to um, summarize it as, as being the session outcomes being the three um, C's. So the first C is that it should give your um, the staff who attend confidence. So not only confidence in um, that the uh, early years curriculum, that they feel confident that the work there is suitable for their children and um, that they can use it in their school, but also the confidence to apply it to their, that their teaching and the confidence to use it, the different range of activities with, your, with their students. Beyond confidence, it's also important that the teachers have consistency. So one of the outcomes for the professional development is to ensure that there is consistency across your classes and year groups by giving the staff the professional development we can make sure that there is a consistency of knowledge for all staff that everyone has the same information to start with and that everyone understands how to use the early years resources so we get a consistency of planning and assessment so you can be sure that whichever class your child has been in and when they move from one class to the next that there will be a consistency support in their education and then finally the professional development will help your teachers have control over their classroom management over the activities that their students complete and also over assessment so that they know when their students are ready to to move on or when they need to intervene and give extra support. So that's the idea of the professional development that it will give all the staff in the school confidence in the resource, provide a consistency across all staff and across all classrooms and help the teachers have real control over how they're teaching and what they're doing within their classroom. Okay, so what does the PD content look like? What are you actually going to cover? Well, as part of the PD content, we ask teachers to look at the 
the key, key priorities in the early years. And we do this via a, a Diamond 9 activity, which uses lots of statements about the early years, and we find which ones the teachers agree with more. So actually, as a, as a little um, activity for you to do now, we are going to ask you to look at these three statements about early practice, best practice in the early years, and to vote for which you agree with the most. So your three statements are, Number one, young students are not able to undertake extended learning activities. Number two, young students need lots of opportunities to practice and repeat activities. And number three, part of the role of early years education is to make students school ready. Um, a poll should pop up on your screen in the next few seconds, and I'd like you to vote for which of these statements you most agree with. So which one do you most agree with out of these? And we'll, we'll see how people are thinking and feeling this morning. So a poll should open and hopefully I can click on my audience view and see what happens. So select the one that you most agree with. We'll give you 30 seconds to do that. For those of you who are watching as a group, have a quick discussion and decide which one as a, as a group you agree with the, the, the most and then get somebody to click on the uh, statement number one, two or three. So one, young students are not able to undertake extended learning activities. Number two, young students need lots of opportunities to practice and repeat activities. And number three, part of the role of early years education is to make students school ready vote for the one that you most agree with. Okay, that should have given everyone enough time. If uh, you'd like to close the poll now, Christian, and we'll uh, see if we can get some results. Ah, here we go. So we can see that uh, about 10% of us agree that young students are not able to undertake extended learning activities. Just over 20% agree with number three, part of the role of early years is to make students school ready. And we've got about 60%, just over 60%. On number two, students need lots of opportunities to practice and repeat activities. Thank you very much for taking part in that. Um, none of the statements are wrong. Um, they, they all do have some, some bearing on on early years and what we do in early years best practice. It's um, interesting that uh, there seems to be a feeling that, that statement two young students need lots of opportunities to practice and repeat activities is the one that um, you agree with most strongly as a group. And uh, that, that's actually really important that because the um, part of the the point of, of, of using the um, early years resources is that they give you way more activities than you, you could actually cover if you um, with your class anyway so it gives you the opportunity to really pick and choose the ones that are most suitable for your students and to be able to practice and repeat activities as often as you can so as I say part of the um, professional development around excuse me <coughs> around the early years resources is not just about the resource itself but also about the best practice in early years so um, we we look at that general um, pedagogical practice and how best to work with these resources in your class as well as looking at pedagogy of the early years the, the professional development module also investigates the contents of the of the units of work for each of the curriculum areas so you can really get to grips with how the curriculum and the support materials are structured and how you might use them in your, your class. So for example, in the section focusing on English, and let me just advance my slide. In the section focused on the English curriculum, we investigate a unit of work on phonics. We try symbol, syllable clapping, letter learning, sound revisions, and phonic blending, all, all within the um, professional development session. 
we not only look at the activities and the lesson plans, but we also look at how schools could then adapt and extend the activities to suit their students and their resources. So let's give you a quick phonics activity to do. Um, I'll, I'll make it a little more suited to adults rather than to four-year-olds, so I won't have you clapping your, um, your names out in syllables at, at the moment, although I would do on the face-to-face -face professional development. What I'd like you to do as a, as a little test to see how awake your brains are this morning or this afternoon is to look at those six uh, phonemes I have there. Uh, I've got S-A-T-P-I-N, so the phonemes are S, A, T, P, I, N. So we're looking at the sounds those letters make. My challenge to you is within a minute, what is the longest word you can think of that uses those phonemes. So you can use them as many times as you want in the word, but you can only use them as pure sounds. So you can only use them as the sounds s, a, t, p, i, n. You can't have the a making an a sound or the i making an i sound. So for example, you could have the word pin, p, i, n, pin, but you couldn't have the word pint because that's p, I and okay. I hope everyone understands that task. So you have got one minute. Hopefully you've got somebody near you you can chat with. If not, you're going to have to rack your own brains. What is the longest word that you can come up with with the letters or the sounds at and if you write them, I think if you write them in the chat window and make them um, to everybody, to all entire audience and we can see them if not use the question window if you haven't got a chat window there and type them in there so i i can see carol has come up with satin straight away lovely satin's a, a great one carol or somebody put up satisfaction which wouldn't work with um an f and paints i can see um p a i and stain make an ai sound so it's not a pure sound, stain, rather than it would be stain. Pants, thank you very much. Whoever put pants up for me. Somebody put up pinnacle. I don't quite know where they got the L from. We've got some great ones coming through. We've got more pants. Very good, Carmen. We've got Assassin, which just came through, which is the uh, longest one I've seen so far. We'll give you another 30 seconds to come through through with these. There are lots of great, uh, great suggestions people have got here. Snap, very good, Kingsley, come through. Spit, we're quite obsessed with pants this morning. I've seen several pairs of pants going through. Spin, stand. A great activity to do with some of your um, slightly older children is to give them these six letters and see if they can write a story with just using those six sounds. It is possible. You do get quite a lot of stories about Santa's satin pants, but it's worth worth trying. Fantastic. There are lots and lots of really good words coming through and some of you have really got the uh, the idea of um, using the phonemes. That's fantastic. Okay, we'll put a hold on there. Wonderful to see so many ones coming through. I think the longest one I saw going through was assassin. So whoever put assassin up as their uh, their word to give themselves a healthy pat on the back. The longest one I could come up with was assistance. Oh, somebody's just uh, somebody just came through. I can't see whose name it is there um, with assistant. And of course, because you've got that spare S, you can change it to assistance. Well done, those people who, who put up those words. You're going to be thinking about that all day now. I think when I uh, was doing this as a practice run, I came up with 67 different words but I'm, I'm sure you can <laughs> you can beat that in in the time you've got so 
as part of the uh, the look into English sessions, we do a lot of work on 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 phonics and phonemes, and you can obviously see how how, how much fun it is to get get started. So we try and do that within the face to face, as as well as investigating the um, English curriculum within the professional development. We also look at examples from the mathematics curriculum and the world around us. Uh, curriculum that covers uh, well-being, social development, keeping healthy, physical activity, creative arts, early science and social studies and the delegates within the PD get the opportunity to study the progression, lesson plans and activities from both these areas and again as they did with the English curriculum get a chance to try some of the activities so who doesn't want to make a lollipop emotions puppet as part of their work with, for the the world around us. The work with the three different curriculum areas covered in the professional development really helps teachers understand the structure and progression within those early years resources, as well as giving them the experience, excuse me, <coughs> of what the day-to-day -day delivery of the um, high primary early years curriculum looks like. The final uh, part of the PD module looks at the assessment that Kevin was was talking about the assessment within the early years resources and assessment within the early years resources is focused on both the formative and summative type of assessments so formative assessments are those ongoing assessments which you do within the lessons at the end and at the end of a lesson to inform you of the next steps for for both teaching and learning but we also look at summative assessments those that summarize what a student can do at a given point so at the end of a topic perhaps and I, th that helps the teachers um, with forming records of achievement and also to identify any gaps in a student's learning before they, they move on. And both of these types of assessment are really important in ensuring that no student gets left behind and that all are achieving their best potential. So in the PD module, we'll look at assessments for English, maths and the world around us to help teachers to really understand what they should be looking for in terms of assessment and what key questions to, to ask. And the important thing is that, that those um, what to look for and key questions are also highlighted in the actual early years resources. So there you have it, a summary of the um, early years professional development. It's set up as a, as a fun and engaging session and it looks at the pedagogy, the curriculum, the teaching, the learning and the assessment all in a half day module or as um, uh, Kevin said earlier with, with the current uh, restrictions on, on travel and face-to-face -face meetings then um, they're also looking at ways of delivering that online as well and so it's ideal for schools who are introducing the I primary early years curriculum into their school and then give them a great start in delivering the uh, fantastic learning experiences contained within. So thank you for listening to, to my bit. I'm gonna now hand back, I think it's gonna go back to Stacey so we can deal with any questions or any queries that anyone's got. So I think it's it's you I'm handing back to Stacey. Yes, hi everyone again. Um, so we've got some few questions popping up. Um, if you, if anyone else has any questions, please do pop them in the questions box and we will answer them. Um, so I think I've got a few uh, for Kevin actually first. So Kevin, if you're still there, hi. Um, we have one around, so textbooks, what are some of the supporting textbooks and is there any recommended texts for early years? Kevin, are you still there? I am, sorry, oh, yeah. I was just, um, <laughs> yep, yeah. hi. Uh, okay, so for maths, we recommend Power Maths Reception. Um, so there's an excellent uh, digital front of class package, uh, which also accompanies um, learning journals for pupils, which is one per term. And then uh, we recommend as a reading scheme to work alongside um, the whole curricula, we recommend uh, the Bug Club Reception Phases uh, and Bug Club Phonics. 
um, and for the teaching of English and the teaching of the world around us, we are bringing out um, pupil workbooks to be published uh, in, I believe, May next year, uh, very early May. Cool, thank you very much. Um, whilst I've got you... Oh, also, add, add to that, Stacey, sorry. Mm -hmm. well, no, of course. I hope you don't mind me cutting in. But, um, of course, if... Um, in terms of the professional development, if um, we were working with a school who was using something like Bug Club, then we would be able to show them at which points during the, the curriculum it, it would be you know, perfect to, to, to fit those, those sorts of texts, reading books, the uh, phonic lessons and uh, all those sorts of activities that were within Bug Club alongside the other resources in iPrimary. Yep, yep. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I think this is a kind of a general question. What is the age group recommended for reception? The okay, so more, Crispin, I suppose. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, we base it around the uh, ages in the UK school system. So uh, you'd start primary I mean, age. So. Uh, reception would be ages three and four and four and five and then year one you're five and six um, but all around the world there's uh, obviously different ages children start at uh, and different phases so it's it's fine to shift the course or adapt it to your setting but we wrote it with ages three to five in mind cool. thank you um, and when will the iPrimary early years curriculum be launched uh, this month so um, everything is ready it just needs to be on our platform so um, there's been a few very dull technical issues uh, involving uh, for obvious reasons a sudden huge increase in people accessing things digitally um, so there's just been a bit of platform work to support that uh, but all of the primary curricula will be up by the end of the month cool fantastic so that also answers the question um, that they can start using it from September this year yes Fantastic. And then I have a question around specifically um, around the world around us. Um, can you please talk a little bit more about this subject and the main content of this subject? Uh, yes, am I? Let me just find. I thought I'd muted. Sorry. OK, um, so the world around us is the third strand of um, our reception curricula and it combines uh, early science so early science is largely based around exploring and discovering the world so it encourages uh, children to uh, question explore and interact with the immediate locality uh, with the world around us to explore the ideas of cause and effect and there's also uh, elements of social um, social development in there as well so there's sections about interactions with friends interactions with peers recognizing your own feelings and how to deal with them um, then there's also creative development in there as well so again exploring different mediums interacting with them using them to represent the world around you um, yeah so there you go cool thank you um, a few questions around resourcing again still can it be used to so can the i primary curriculum be used with existing resources that the school might have um, if they use yes. a different reading scheme or anything yes, else? absolutely. So uh, the reading scheme, as as with all reading schemes, reading schemes tend to sit alongside formal teaching rather than being part of the lesson. So if you have a different reading scheme, it's fine to carry on using it. I think that's something we also highlight within the professional development that one of the great advantages of, of the early years resource is, is that you can have it as an editable um, lesson plans or uh, editable activity plans so if you're working on a, a particular area say phonics and you th think well actually I've got a really good resource that we already use you can actually match that in with the um, the I um, primary early years curriculum resources so you actually are expanding <laughs> the resource you've got and making it most suitable for your your students so yes don't don't chuck out anything you already have it can work alongside um, the early years resources and then then you'd be using the early years resources to ensure that you had really good progression through your years so you fit the activities in where where the um, 
they, they suit the progression. Cool, thank you. And then I think we have just a few kind of generic kind of questions that Crispin, you might be able to answer. Um, I'll have a go. You, yeah, <laughs> do you believe in learning through play? Absolutely. And why? <laughs> um, in terms of, yes, yes, one word answer, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. But there is a difference between completely free play and uh, structured play where teachers have set out a range of activities that they allow children to explore. So, for example, if I was doing work on the uh, phonics as, as, as we were and we were looking at those um, six key phonemes, I would, alongside all the other games and toys, I would make sure that my uh, home play area had lots of things that begin with s and t and, p and n in, in it so I can actually use those as part of the ongoing learning process. But absolutely, um, children learn better when they're well engaged and children are well engaged when they're, when they're playing with things. Cool, thank you. And then a follow up to that is, um, what do, you, do you think it is important to introduce books in kindergarten? Um, Yes, uh, well, I, I think before before you start with um, books, I think that actually it's it's the storytelling and the listening to stories and and repeating stories. So the books you might be using might just be big picture books with a teacher saying, "Oh, I wonder what's happening here. What might be happening in this story? What might happen next?" So from that that point of actually helping children understand how stories work and that um, you. Know, sounds build words, words build sentences, sentences build stories, then then that's really important for, ch for children to learn. And we find that children who struggle to read as early readers are often the ones who have not had access to books at home and not had a, a, a strong early um, listening to stories and hearing stories experience. So yes, um, talking um, ab about stories and um, using books with children is really important. I don't think there's quite such a rush to actually get them to to read them themselves in the very early years. But of course, lots of children are, are, are read ready. So, you know, if, if you can get them straight on to reading books, then fantastic. But yes, I think I think it's more about understanding stories and sharing that experience before you go to to books. But then we're talking about children are starting at the age of, of three here. Cool. Thank you very much. Um... And then we have another one around so for you, Crispin. Can a five-year-old child be sure. assessed through quizzes? Through quizzes? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it, the, the most of the assessment within um, the early years is about teacher discussion because if, if you're using you can use quizzes, but it's how what, what format you deliver those to a, a child and how you record the answers. If you are getting children to write stuff down as part of an assessment, then what you're doing is assessing their ability to write stuff down partly, which is probably not what you want to be doing. So the reason that, that the early years resources use lots of discussion is that that allows teachers to prompt um, children in, in the correct way, but also allows children the freedom to demonstrate their knowledge without having to then also demonstrate their skills of fine motor skills to hold a pen or their their, their letter work um, writing um, and, and, and written ability. So I think in terms of, of assessment, what, what one needs to do is on a very, um, on a day to day and lesson by lesson, um, stance is, is to look at what children are doing and that that's all about what questions you can ask as a teacher and what things you're looking for then when you're doing a slightly more summative assessment at the end of a topic then it's about the teacher drawing out the child's knowledge and talking to them about what they've learned within that that, that topic rather than having a a quiz which may demonstrate their knowledge but more um, at this age demonstrates their ability to understand how a quiz works and to write things down. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, f further to that, I mean, I'd, I'd just reiterate what Crispin has said there. So the assessments that we provide as part of a reception course are designed to stimulate that teacher discussion. It's, it is literally a, a rich, information-rich illustration 
um, it, with very little or no writing on it at all and it's there for the teacher to talk about with the child so it might be questions like are there more pencils or rubbers or how many of this or what do you think so and so is thinking um, and we help provide that that structure and questions you might want to ask and then guidance about what particular developmental points those questions are uh, looking at but the child itself shouldn't I, I think at this age they shouldn't really understand it's a formal high stakes test it's really about um, a collaborative assessment Thank you. Um, and because you're talking, Kevin. And the essential thing for assessment at this age, sorry, Stacey, no, to across you, the essential thing uh, 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 about assessment at this age is, is what do I do next? Um, you know, where, as children get older, as, as Kevin said, tests become more high stakes and it's about what grade you can get in things. Um, particularly with the early years, it's about saying, if you can't do this at the moment, what do I as a teacher need to do next to ensure you can? Or if you struggle with this, how, how do I support you? Now, of course, if you're doing uh, assessing something quite formal, like can you actually write the letters at um, then you would need the child to write those down to show that. But that would be done in the context of an activity, a fun activity that might be making the letters with string, making the, painting the letters, um, do, cutting them out, those sorts of things to uh, to actually build it into an activity. I think this brings us nicely on to okay. sort of the next batch of kind of questions or areas that people are asking around. Um, so I think this is more for Kevin. Um, a few people have asked, uh, the, around the um, resources that are available online to the Active Learn platform. Um, could you just kind of give us a, a brief overview of what is on there in terms of kind of curriculum documents and any additional resources for teachers? Uh, yeah, I mean, specifically on Active Learn for iPrimary Reception, when it's added uh, this month, you will have access to the full curriculum documents uh, the full schemes of work, providing the topic by topic overviews, uh, the full lesson planning, which is the day by day teaching and the activities and pupil worksheets uh, and stimulus. Uh, so things like photos, illustrations, things like that. You'll have access to all of the tests as well. And then um, if you sign up to them, in addition, you can also access the Bug Club reading scheme um, and Power Maths reception as well. Uh, so Bug Club Reading Scheme, it's, it's e-books consisting of um, uh, very nice looking kind of trade type um, books to look at with the children, to talk about for children, including notes for discussion and questions embedded within them. Um, and then Power Maths Online. Um, so there's front of class teaching, there's activities, there's games, there's songs, uh, which work with our teaching and lesson planning and course. Um, and then I believe you can see the learning journals online, but I, certainly for children this age, the learning journals are very much more of a physical, manipulable thing that you'd expect them to interact with. Um, so the print version would be what we'd recommend for the learning journals. Cool, thank you very much. Um, we've had absolutely loads of questions, and if I can't get round to them in this session, then um, what I will do is I will kind of write uh, responses and they'll be posted as FAQs so um, next to the webinar so you'll be able to see all the questions that came in and then the answers to them as well. So we've got a few more there's a lot around PD so I will I will talk about that sort of towards the end end of the session. Um, so when is a suitable time to introduce syllables are three to four years old ready especially when it's a second language? I think it's going to be Crispin, Kevin, whichever. So I, I, I mean, it very much depends on the individual child's language development. So the the English planning within the course structures it. Uh, so it really, I've, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't want to get the wrong answer, but I think it comes in, in kind of the second year of reception there. Um, but the focusing is very much on, on when they're ready for it, which is a bit of a non-answer, I understand. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that um, it's going to be different for for different schools, for different pupils. Um, I, I believe you certainly can do um, phonic learning. In, in, in fact, the recommendation is that, that you do it as early as you can, because um, children 
have a very good ear for sound, even though they might not know the technical um, jargon and the technical terms for what they're doing but children are very good at identifying the shortest sound within things about blending sounds and as Kevin said because you have a such a good progressive uh, curriculum with the, with the early years curriculum here that if you are working on a, on a particular area and you think my children aren't ready for this then you can look at the whole wealth of carousel activities that go around that and add in activities of your own and say well actually I'm going to do a little more uh, base work before I, I focus on this with my children but I certainly believe you, you can um, do that phonetic um, learning the um, and the children can learn things like um, phonemes and, and, and how to blend and how to produce a smooth co-articulation when they're they're reading it is that little bit harder as uh, as a second language of, of of course but that's why there is there is um this this strong progression within the the, the curriculum so you can move children on at the pace that they, they need to you know and only you will know your children really well cool thank you very much um so i'll quickly talk about pd because it seems to be a fairly hot topic in the questions um so someone asked whether we're planning to hold face-to-face -face training internationally that is our usual um, method of delivery however given the circumstances and to keep staff and teachers safe there will be no more face-to-face -face training for the remainder of this year however that doesn't mean that there is no training whatsoever um, we will be doing training sessions like this uh, via go to webinar via zoom um, and you'll be able to request your PD that you would normally request uh, through your IPLS school coordinator um, or with your uh, regional uh, Pearson representative. Um, we can be flexible given that we can now deliver a lot of the training digitally. Um, so we can really work with you, your schools and your teachers. Um, and early years PD has just been finished by Crispin, so um, that will be available um, as a professional development module as soon as soon as schools start to ask for it, and we can get we can get them booked in. Um, so, for any schools that are introducing I primary early years or any of the other um, IPLS subjects, um, we will definitely be able to kind of either book in for this year digital training and then going forward we will be assessing when it is safe to resume face-to-face -face, um, and you will be notified of this via your IPLS coordinators or the newsletters that we send out um, so it's kind of a watch this space but we are still here and we will still deliver training for you so then a few more to finish on um, and there's one question that I'm kind of leaving to last because I think it'll be a nice kind of ending question. Um, oh, we have had one around, have either of you, Crispin or Kevin, heard of Talk for Writing by Pi? And what are your thoughts yes. on it? Yes, yeah, by Pi Corbett. Mm -hmm. uh, Pi Corbett, yes. Uh, yeah, Talk for Writing, it's... Um, it, 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 there is a, a set of resources that go around it, but the basic... Uh, principle of a talk for writing is a really really simple one and it was come up with uh, by the author Pi Corbett who basically said if you can't talk about it you can't write about it so the idea with talk for writing is that before you do any writing whether it's writing a story a, a letter a report a journal that you, you spend a, a uh, a decent amount of time talking about what you're going to write about what could possibly happen within your writing and that this promotes a much much better standard of writing the difficulty for for particularly for young children is that when they come to a, a piece of extended writing they are so focused on handwriting spelling letter shape letter order um, paragraphs punctuation that they actually forget about the content so what you end up with is, is a well spelled nicely written uh, well punctuated piece of writing that isn't actually very good apart from the fact it's grammatically and correct and it's neat the idea with talk for writing is that you have lots of discussion about the writing 
before the children actually put pen to paper and, and you build up uh, lots of skills in, in, in terms of being able to talk about your writing so that when children actually come to write the piece, they focus on the content of the writing, not particularly on the, the punctuation or the, the, the grammar or the spelling. Those are seen as slightly separate entities. Cool. And we've actually had a few more questions pop in um, around writing. Um, so there's a few on at what age would you recommend students writing and um, to start writing? Um, well, as early as, as, as they're ready, it depends what you what you mean by writing. If I'm talking about students making you know, marks on paper or uh, um, uh, confidently writing their, their name, um, writing numerals, being able to shape letters, then I would certainly be doing that with, with children in the early years. In terms of writing a story or an extended piece of writing, then that, that would come um, slightly later. But in, in terms of, of, of those early writing skills, then you want those started as, as, as early as you can. But again, you don't, um, you're not, don't want to be too focused on the technical aspect of it. Although, um, you know, being able to um, have fine motor skills that control a pen well are really important. But I would be looking at that as a skill, you know, the fine motor skill of, of, of pen holding and doing lots of activities to, to try and build those fine motor skills um, as, as well as, as doing some basic mark making. Um, also, I, th I, th I think that, that um, you, you have to see writing as, as, as part of a, uh, the, the, the practical curriculum that you do with children, that it becomes, uh, you know, uh, as, as well as becoming a technical um, aspect of what they're, they're doing, that it also is a, as a fun and engaging and, and that writing is offered as one of the choices among some free play activities. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then the final two questions. Um, what year is appropriate for blending in phonics? Well, I, I blend with my uh, reception class who are four-year-olds. So, so, um, and we start with um, just the, those six phonemes that I gave you earlier, Satpin, uh, are the um, are the ones that we, that we start with and then we the next would be we'd add in uh, the letter m the sound m, and we're trying to build um the sounds that the pure sounds that, that that build the most words basically and so i do i do blending um with my uh reception class in their their second week of school and by the third week of school they can all take a book home now, now it is a a fairly um simple story but they can um, blend and uh, decode and read uh, the first book in the, um, the in fact Bug Club Phonics is, is, is what I've used so they have the Alpha Blocks um, books and they're reading their first book within uh, three four weeks of school using those first six phonemes so we do that smooth co-articulation um, right from the, the beginning. Thank you very much. And then the final question, which I think is quite a nice one to end on. Um, will this uh, I primary early years curriculum transition students well to year two and beyond? Year one, sorry, and beyond. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> that, that is specifically how it's been designed. So um, we took the start of year one as the end point for the curriculum so we're trying to develop the the skills and uh really the ability to learn so you're learning how to learn very much at that age uh, build it into the curriculum so you're ready to begin your one thank you very much yeah i think i i, I would add add to that 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 having been through in, in writing the PD, having been through lots and lots and lots of, of, of lesson plans for all the three different um, curriculum areas within the early years, that I found there are just so many um, activities that are interesting and engaging and exciting for those early years pupils and keep them very active and are easy to adapt for the teachers. But I can also see within all those activities that there is a, a genuine desire to make children ready for, for year one, year two, year three, and so on. Also, I think it's really important to point out that these 
early years, it's very important to ensure that no child is, is being left behind and there aren't any gaps in learning. And I, I think the early years curriculum is really good at ensuring that there aren't gaps in, in students' learning because any gaps they have at this point in their learning will affect them um, as they move up, up through the school because there's very often very little time to go back over previous stuff in, in, in school. You know, time is always very tight. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so just a few kind of notes or points to make before we finish up. Uh, the recording of the webinar um, will be made available uh, for everyone to um, obviously revisit at their own at their own leisure or to pass on to colleagues, uh, senior leadership teams at, at their schools. Um, so a newsletter with the links will go around shortly and it will be made available on the uh, international community schools blog um, with FAQs of questions that we couldn't get around to answering today. So that will be made available to anyone that missed it or anyone that joined slightly later on. Um, with that being said, thank you very much, Crispin and Kevin, for your time this morning. I hope it's been um, useful for everyone else. It's certainly been useful for me. Um, and if you have any other questions, please do get in contact with your uh, local Pearson representative and they'll be able to either answer the question for you or ensure that someone will be able to answer your question for you. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Crispin and Kevin. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for the excellent questions that people sent through. Yes, thank you, everyone, for signing in.